I love not the irony, but the truth of that statement. So let's just come together this morning and just together be thankful for our Creator, our Father, Jesus Christ. So let's bow our heads and pray before we begin our music. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for these people. And just, yes, be with us. Be the ones that aren't here as well, Lord. Let them know that they have a home. And that home doesn't have a roof. And that home doesn't have a, a weekly meeting. That home is there for eternity, waiting for them. Be with our words. Be with our songs. And let your heart be overjoyed with our honest, true love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. tries to roll over my bones. The sorrow comes to steal the joy I long. Brokenness, pain is all I know. Why well, won't be shaken? Why well, won't be shaken? My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stay
body bowed and drenched in tears and laid him down. Nodded 
at the two young fish saying, morning boys, how's the water? The two young fish nodded back and kept on swimming without giving an answer. After a moment of silence, one of the fish turned to the other and asked, what is water? <laughs> you know, sometimes the most important realities are the ones that are hardest to see. And restlessness has become so normalized in our culture that we are unaware that we are swimming in it. We are restless. And so we fill our shopping carts with stuff that we do not have the space to store or money to buy. We're restless, and so we spend hours on social media seeking to be seen, to be valued, and to be loved. We are restless, and so we work hard and sleep less. We are restless, and so we travel to places we've never been in search of an experience we have never had. We're restless, and so we worry about what people will think of us if we don't meet their expectations. We're restless, and so we hop from one church to another, searching for the best teaching, the best music, the best youth programming, the best facilities. We're restless, and so we distract ourselves with entertainment and social interaction in order to numb the restlessness that we feel. We just keep swimming, we just keep going, we just keep moving forward until someone swimming in the opposite direction asks us, how's the water? About 400 years after Jesus, there was a Christian from Northern Africa named Augustine, and he wrote some words that have been repeated throughout Christianity for the last 1,500 years. He said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. I want to talk to you about finding rest in Jesus. Now, in the Old Testament, the Jewish people were a lot like us. They were restless. They were restless, and so they would, because they looked to, to get things from God rather than seeking God himself. They were restless, and so they wanted a king to rule over them. They were restless, and so they wanted to have the prosperity that other nations had. They were restless, and so they complained, and they criticized their leaders. They were restless because they had missed the obvious, that God had shown them compassion by rescuing them from slavery in Egypt, that God had provided food and water for them to eat and drink while they were wandering in the wilderness, that God had brought them into a land to call their own a place of peace where they could rest. And yet, they were restless. They had turned their backs on God. They took advantage of God's compassion and power. They even said in Jeremiah 5.12 that God will do nothing, that no harm will come to us, that we will never see sword or famine. They refused to repent even though they had been unfaithful to God because they followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They were restless because they were looking to anything and everything other than God to find rest. And now the Jewish people were about to be taken into exiles to live as strangers in a land that was not their own with no place to call their home. Can you see yourself in this story? Like, does it feel like the world around us is moving towards chaos? Does it feel like suffering is gathering her armies to besiege your city? Do you feel alone? Do you feel vulnerable? Do you feel the weight of responsibility to, to lead maybe in the church or in your place of work or even at home with your family? Do you feel unqualified or unequipped to do God's work? Is your marriage on the verge of collapse? Is your job paying the bills but at the expense of your values? Do, do your children fight for the freedom to make their own decisions? Does your heart ache maybe because you've lost someone that you love? Or does your heart grieve because you long to see someone that you love come home? Is it difficult for you to forgive someone for the hurt they caused you? Is, is your mind a battle with no victory in sight? Is your faith in God maybe being carried off into exile? Well, it's in this context that God gives the Jewish people this invitation in Jeremiah 6, verse 16. God says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is, and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. So this is something that I've been thinking about 
this week. God uses four imperatives in this verse. Stand, look, ask, and walk. And usually we interpret imperatives as commands, right? God says to do something, do this, do not do that. And it's a command that he's giving us. But I wonder if we can interpret these imperatives to stand, to look, to ask, and to walk as invitations rather than commands. I wonder if our interpretation of, of whether or not these are commands or invitations comes from our view of God. So if God to us is this dictatorial judge who tells us what we can do and what we cannot do, then sure, these imperatives are going to sound like commands with consequences if we do not obey, right? But what if we replaced our view of God as this dictatorial judge with a view of God as a compassionate shepherd? Like this is the portrait that the Bible uses time and time again, that God or Yahweh promises to be a shepherd to his people, the Jewish people, and that Jesus then comes and says that he is the good shepherd. David is even said to uh, have a heart after, have, be a man after God's own heart, and David has the heart of a shepherd. So then listen to the invitation that Jesus gives in Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Does that sound familiar? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Did you notice the heart of God in this invitation? That God's desire is that we will find rest for our souls. He said that in Jeremiah 6, 16, Jesus says it in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. And Jesus says the reason that he desires restless people to come to him is because he is gentle and lowly in heart. Does that not sound like the heart of a shepherd? Jesus' invitation is not to study and to know this or to go and to do that. Jesus does not give us directions to heaven. He doesn't give us this treasure map that's going to lead us to X that marks the spot. He doesn't plug in the destination to our phones and tell us to listen to a man with an Australian accent to turn right or to turn left. Jesus does not point to a path or teach a truth or illustrate a life. He says that I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And as long as we look for guidance, truth, and life outside of Jesus, then we will wander aimlessly endlessly and restlessly. And that's why Jesus' invitation is to come to him and to walk in relationship with him. That's why David wrote, after wandering himself, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, and what does he do? He restores my soul. So what do we do when we feel Restless. Well, God invited the Jewish people, and he invites us in the same way, to respond in four different ways. To stand, to look, to ask, and to walk. So you, can you say those with me? Stand, look, ask, and walk. Now, as we go through these, I don't want this to sound like a formula, because we don't find rest in a process or in a prescription, but in a person. And the person is Jesus. So first, let's talk about standing. Now, if you're a swimmer and you swim laps, what's the last thing that you do before you go underwater? Take a breath. What's the first thing you do when you come up from the water? Hopefully, take a breath. And so if we're restless, what is the first thing that we must do? Take a deep breath. This is cool. The root for the Hebrew word rest means to breathe. And so when we're restless, you know this, our hearts beat faster, we take shorter breaths, but when we're at rest, when we have the sense of peace, our hearts beat slower, and we're able to take deeper, longer breaths. So everyone take a deep breath with, breath, breath with me. Hold it for a second. Now exhale. Exhaling is the rest that we feel when we find Jesus. There's a restlessness about us when we breathe in and we hold it, right? We're wondering when we're going to maybe come up from the water, when we're going to be able to release that breath that we've just taken in. And our, we feel when we exhale is how we feel when we find the rest that Jesus promises to find in him. 
So living in this continual state of restlessness is, is like never coming up for air or holding our breath. And before that we can do anything, what do we need to do? We need to catch our breath. And so when we're invited to stand, it means that we're invited to stop walking, to catch our breath, to slow down. And yet it's, we're not told to stand and sit. We're told to stand because there's an element to which we need to be ready to take the next step. We're standing. We're ready so that when we know what direction to go, we're standing at the crossroads. We're able to go in that direction. And so the reminder is that resting is okay. Saying no to things is okay. Slowing down, creating margin is okay. And so the first thing we do is just pause, we take a deep breath, and then we're able to, number two, look. Now kids, I need your help with this one. I need you to turn to your parents or someone close to you, and I need you to give them a mischievous look. All right, so turn, turn, turn to your parents and give them a mischievous look. Now parents, you know that look, right? If your kids aren't here, you can imagine that look, right? That's the look of someone who knows the right thing to do, but they're about to do the wrong thing, isn't it? You know, puppies are the same way. Uh, Kayla and I don't have kids yet, but we do have a seven-month-old golden retriever puppy. Her name is Marie. Uh, is anyone in here named Marie? <laughs> Anybody? All right, well, I can say this then. Marie just seems like the name of a mischievous person or pet. Um, so she lives up to her name. Uh, because she'll get this look in her eye when she's taking one of our socks or chewing on our arms, doing what she knows she's not supposed to do, but what does she do? She does it anyway, and she does it with a mischievous look in her eye. <laughs> and you know, even when kids or when pets act this way, do you love them any less? Do you love them any less? No. In the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah, who wrote the book of Jeremiah, picks up his pen and paper again, but this time he's writing the book of Lamentations while they're in exile. So he wrote the book of Jeremiah before they were taken away into exile, and now he's writing this while they're away. And it's a lament, Lamentations. It's, it's, a, it's a book about the grief and the weight that the Jewish people feel because they're not living where God had promise for them to live, they're living in exile. And this is what God says in Lamentations 3, 31 through 33. He says, for the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he caused grief, like though there are things that they grieve that cause them pain, there are things in their life that they wish were different, he, God, will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. Now, that word for compassion is the kind of love that churns your stomach, that causes your body to ache when you see someone hurting. It's even the kind of love that moves us toward those who have even hurt us. And that's the kind of love that God has for us. And so God doesn't afflict or discipline or allow bad things to happen from his heart. God can afflict, discipline, and allow bad things to happen even while having compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. That's why the writer of Hebrews tells us that there are times even when God disciplines the one that he loves. And so we may give God a mischievous look and do what we should not do, but like a father who loves his children, God can do what seems harsh and even feels painful, but knows it is for our good and never cease to be loving. And so when our circumstances are painful and we wonder if God cares about us, rather than look around at our circumstances, we need to look at the heart of God, the heart of a compassionate shepherd and rest in his abundance, the abundance of his steadfast love. Because his love and our pain are not mutually exclusive. So we stand, we take a deep breath, we look at his heart, and we remember who he is and his love for us, and then we're able to move to number three, ask. Now remember, we're standing on a crossroads, right? And asking questions is important before we choose a path. You don't just want to look at the paths and make the first Make a decision that's based on maybe the first appearance. You want to pause and you want to ask some questions. And maybe those are asking questions of God. Maybe it's asking questions of other people. Maybe it's asking questions of what God has written in scripture, right? It says, ask for the ancient paths. Ask those who have gone before you to see which way they have walked in. But this also means that we must ask ourselves some questions. 
So years ago, there was this Jewish rabbi who spoke these words on his deathbed. Looking back at the rest of his life, he, he spoke these words. He said, when I was young, I set out to change the world. And when I grew a little older, I perceived this was probably too ambitious, so I set out to change my state. And this too, I realized as I grew older, was too ambitious, so I set out to change my town. And when I realized I could not even do this, I tried to change my family. And now, as an old man, I know that I should have started by changing myself. If I had started with myself, maybe then I would have succeeded in changing my family, the town, or even the state, and who knows, maybe even the world. I doubt that Michael Jackson knew who this Jewish rabbi was, but he wrote something similar in one of his hit songs. It's been going through my mind all morning. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways, and no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make a change. Amen. We must look in the mirror and ask ourselves the question, why? Ask why we're restless. Ask why we respond how we respond. Ask why that person or that thing angers us. Ask why we feel inadequate. Ask why we're so competitive. Ask why we return to that habit or that addiction and again and again. Ask why we're critical of others. Ask why we're anxious. Ask why we place so much value on the work that we do. Ask why we're distracted by the approval of people. Ask why we avoid gathering weekly with other Christians. Ask why we avoid talking more openly about who Jesus is. Maybe even ask God to make you compassionate, like he is compassionate. Ask God to open your eyes to see people the way that he sees people. Ask God to make your heart break for what breaks his. See, asking ourselves these questions will allow us then to move to ask God questions, to help us understand the how and the what. And the how and the what are the, the way that we should take, the path that we're supposed to walk on. And the purpose in asking ourselves questions is not to change our circumstances or to explain why these bad things happened. The purpose in asking questions is to simply know ourselves and then to know God's heart. And once we stand and we look to him and we ask ourselves why, then we can move to the final thing. Number four, walk. So walking is this continual conversation with God. It's about a relationship with him. We are responding to his invitation to come and to walk with him. That's the invitation he gave to his disciples, right? Come, follow me, walk with me, learn from me. And even when we do not have all the answers, even when we feel overwhelmed, we can trust God's heart as we walk with him and he leads us step by step. Remember, he's a gentle shepherd with a compassionate heart. And he invites us to walk with him in green pastures, beside still waters, and even through the valley of the shadow of death. Amen. Even when we walk through the valley, even when we experience the grief and the suffering, God's heart is that he loves us, he has compassion for us, and he grieves along with us. Amen. But as long as we are with the shepherd, even when we walk through that valley, even when we have difficult circumstances, as long as we pause and examine our hearts and then look to his heart as our compassionate shepherd, the promise is in Jeremiah and in Matthew 11 that we will find what? Rest for our souls. Now, I want to speak to those of you first who do not have a community of Christians in which you feel like you belong. We hope that this gathering of churches is the first of many gatherings in years to come. And that a whole lot more churches will join us and worship with us when we gather together. We want to create unity. We're not trying to create uniformity. And so if you are hoping that the service gets out on time so you can get home to watch the Sunday football games that start this week, you'll know that a football team has a number of different teams even within the team, right? You have an offensive team, a defensive team, and I hope I'm saying this right, a special teams team, a special teams team. And every coach and every player, regardless of what team they're on or regardless of what role they have, has the same mission, right? They use their different strengths 
and a different method of playing, and they take the field at different times, but they're all working together to fulfill the same mission. And each of us has a different role to play on Jesus' team. Each t church acts like an offensive team, maybe, or a defensive team, or a special teams team, taking the field at different times and fulfilling the mission in a different way, but there's one team, and we're all on that team. There's a, a Barna Group study from a few years ago revealed that four out of ten unchurched people avoid church because of a bad church experience. And when they say bad church experience, they're not talking about low production quality, boring teaching, or even doctoral differences. They're talking about an unwelcoming environment, a cliquish culture, leadership failings, a lack of transparency, Abuse, gossip, and division. These are the bad experiences that four out of ten unchurched people are trying to avoid. And we can all acknowledge that these bad and even painful experiences cause us to be restless, don't they? The church needs healing. Churches need healing. You and I need healing. And we want people to look at this gathering and see that we love Jesus more than we love our church. That we value building God's kingdom more than we value building our church. We want people to look at this gathering and say, I'm not going to give up on the church. And so even when our worship, we are worshiping separately next week, even when we're taking the field at a different time, we want to be worshiping together, as Corey said, in spirit and united in purpose because we're on the same team. Now I want to speak to those of you who are not following Jesus. You find yourself standing at the crossroads. You feel restless. You're wondering which path to take. I want you to know that we want to help you take your first step in following Jesus. I hope that you were able to stand among us to look, to look around and to ask yourself, why is there something different about these Christians? Well, the difference is the rest that our souls have found in Jesus. And we want to help you begin walking with Jesus so that you can find the same rest for your soul. So, how's the water? Father, we are so thankful that you have a heart that is full of compassion, that you are our shepherd, that you are our father, that you are gentle and lowly in heart, Lord, that you grieve with us when we grieve. Lord, when we wander, when we feel restless, when we close our eyes and we don't look at you and your goodness and in your glory, when we don't praise your name, when we don't hail King Jesus, Lord, that you still love us. And you're waiting there with open arms for us to come home. Lord, would you give our souls rest right now as we finish the service and, Lord, into this week, as we worship separately next week, as we continue to fulfill the mission that you have given us to make disciples in Brown County, Indiana. Lord, would you, would you give us the strength and the, and the rest that we need in order to manifest your presence in the church each and every day. Lord, if there is anyone here who feels like their heart has stopped, or that they're looking to you, they're seeing you for, in all your glory, and they're asking what path to take, what is the next step that they have, Lord, we ask that you would give them the courage to talk to someone about walking with you and taking that first step. Lord, we love you, and we're thankful for your love for us. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and get your communion ready. Go ahead and reveal the cracker and the juice. John 14, Jesus references that the Father's house has many rooms. If any of you grew up with siblings, 
you would know that you all, if you all had different rooms, they looked different, right? Different decor, different themes, different colors maybe, and they felt different. But at the core, they were still family. And that's, when Andrew and I were talking, we were talking about how our churches are a lot like that. And we believe that, I, I feel like when we look at this passage, God is talking, or Jesus is talking about how all these churches are different rooms. But at the core, we're still family, right? We look different, we feel different, we sometimes act different. But communion is when we sit at the table together. Like Jesus said in John 17, and pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am, I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Ephesians 2, 20-22 uh, says, You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Today is at the table that the Christians may come to the closest to fulfilling that prayer of the Lord. Right? For the oneness of his followers. In Jeremiah I love that Andrew used Jeremiah a lot because I've been looking at Jeremiah this week. And in Jeremiah, this, the, Israelites, the Israelite nation has forgotten God. And yet, today, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Their inability to love God, to create and worship other gods and idols, their inability to love people well. Today, looking back on a nation, we can remember, many of us can remember that day, 9-11. We remember the concern and the worry and the fear, but what we also remember is a nation that came together for one purpose where they came together and they stood and rose to the occasion to be united. In Ephesians 6, it says, For we, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So today you may remember 9-11. You may remember that feeling of unity, but today, as followers of Christ, as I said earlier, we're not separated by a building, but we are united at the table, taking part in the body and the blood of Jesus. Today, together, we remember Jesus. We remember what he did for us, individually and corporately. The price that was paid on the cross, not only eternity, not only restoration of relationship to the Father, but even in moments of darkness like September 11th, 2001, we can be comforted by the love and peace of Jesus. So if you would, get your cracker. Reading from 1 Corinthians. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it, for every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again.
going to ask you to stand for the worship team to come up. I want you to close in, grab the hand of someone uh, before we leave. I think that being united in prayer would be ideal for our community, for our state, for our nation. I love that Andrew challenges to look in the mirror. So when you all go home, put on Michael Jackson's song and look at yourself. <laughs> but I would challenge that as we change ourselves with the mindset of being united, we can actually change our community. We can bring change to a state and to a nation. And so let's get united. I'm going to. I'm asking my wife to come up here. I want her to hold her hand. <laughs> So join me in prayer. Let's be united. Father, we give thanks that the works of the cross, the blood of Jesus, unites us as brothers and sisters in you. Father, we ask that you would use us in mighty ways in our community. Father, bringing honor to you, pointing people to your son, Jesus. Father, help us be a light into our community. Father, we want to see the lost become saved by your spirit. Help us be spreaders of the gospel your truth. Lord, unite our efforts and our good works for you. We ask that through you we would be a beacon of light to this state. A community of peace and of your love. That we would see people free from the oppression of the enemy of their soul. Father, we ask that you would unite our states and that this nation would put you back into the leadership role of who we are. Just like the Old Testament days, Father, when the enemies of God's people, when they saw the Jewish nation, they saw the God of the Jewish people as great. Not the people, but the God of them. Father, we ask that we would return to a nation where our enemies would see that we are great because you are a great God. Father, you are great, and we love you, and we bless you, and we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, sing this with us right as we go out. Father, we just bless you. Father, we just say thank you. What a powerful day to come united with our brothers and sisters for one morning to have no walls between us but to simply worship you together 
as one. Brother, we thank you for this building that it's here in our community that we can utilize it, that we can come together. We ask that as we move forward, unite us in cause and purpose, unite our resources. And Father, as we go forward, we ask that you would bring others on board that we would get so tight-knit as a community that we would have impact and change. We would draw people unto you. We love you and we bless you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.